Okay, let's continue. Philippians chapter 3. I hope you really get Paul's mindset on this. Paul is really saying that there's been a change. Whenever you read Philippians chapter 3, the first word that comes out to you is change. But the change is really based on his mindset. His thinking has changed. Why is his thinking changed? Because there's been an effect in his life. He gives example of that effect in Philippians chapter 2. He testifies to that effect in Philippians chapter 1. And he explains it and defines it in Philippians chapter 3. And then he counsels from that mind in Philippians chapter 4. There's been an effect in his life, and it is the effect of humility. Because in the activity of humility, there is a work of grace. There is a work of grace in my life. That is only possible through humility. Because grace does not work in pride. Grace does not work in the atmosphere or the environment of pride. But in the environment of humility, grace is not only abundant, it is abounding in Romans chapter 5, verse 20. In humility. In humility. It's key for me. The first effect of humility in my life is there is a change in my focus mentally. change in my focus mentally. And then as Paul describes the change in my mental state or my focus, there is a change in my value system. Because my frame of reference has changed. There's a change in my value system. What was important to me is no longer important to me. There's a change in my value system. Paul describes that. After explaining what he used to find value in, Paul says, no longer do those things have value. And I find it interesting that Paul does not say it's not as important as it was before. Paul says it's rendered useless. Useless. He takes it from 100% to zero. And that requires a cross. He just immediately drops the value. He subtracts all value. You know why? Because in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, Paul gives no place to the devil. No place. He says, nope. I render it useless. I render it useless. I count it loss. And when you count everything lost, it costs you something. That's why nobody likes to count things lost. <laughs> because we were just talking about this on the break. When Paul rendered those things lost, those things had value to him. Paul was on a career track, he was a career path. He was an up and coming Pharisee. He was an example. He was a role model. He was like the young executive on his way religiously. He was, I'm sure he was being pegged for big positions. Paul was like the example. Here's this young trained gun, and he's making a career out of crushing the church. This guy is making all the right choices in Judaism. He's making all the right decisions. His career path is in front of him. Then Acts chapter 9 comes. With a prelude going back to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 9 comes and crushes his career path. Sometimes we have all these things we want to do for God, and the Holy Spirit comes in the plan of God and just gives you a rude awakening. You ever had that happen? You made all these plans, I'm going to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And God just comes along and balls up your plan and throws it out the way. He says, huh? He starts speaking in unknown languages, languages of angels all of a sudden. Why? It's Isaiah chapter 55 is so true, verses 8 through 11. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Sometimes we think that our thoughts are close to God's thoughts. And that, it, you know, with a little bit of help from God, they connect. They are as far as the east is from the west. Because the flesh is never finding comfort in God's plan, ever. And if my flesh has found comfort in the plan, it's not God's. I'm called to be a pastor to Hawaii. 
and sell pineapple during the day and preach at night. Yes, that's got to be God. No! Your guardian angel's like laughing. <laughs> huh? You must have the New World Translation. That can't be the, the, the King James. To see what version you're using. Imagine that. I, Paul said two things here that are crucial. Number one, he says, I count everything of loss. And, here's the, and then he gives the other side of when you count things of loss. He says, I have suffered loss of all things. Paul says, I have lost in so many ways you can't even imagine. For me to, if you walk in humility with God, there are two things that are certain. Number one, you will count some things of value as loss. And number two, you will suffer loss. You'll lose some things that are valuable. Could be financial. Instead of walking in pride on your job, you walk in humility and it costs you a promotion. For Paul, it cost him his religious career. The name of Paul was ruined in Jerusalem. This rising star, this up-and-comer in Judaism is now a rebel going out of a basket out of a window. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Up and coming, his future was so bright. What a fool. I'm sure Pharisees were saying, look at what he could have become. He could have been the next great school of Pharisees. Now look at him, a rebel on the run. What is he doing? He's wasting his life. You ever heard that? See, this is the excuse from the world. The world says this when you make a choice for God and you walk in humility and you say yes to God's plan and no to your plan. The world says you're a fool. The world says you're wasting your life. Bible school, you're wasting your life. What kind of career can you get with a four-year degree in Bible school? When has going to church ever been financially profitable for you? One pastor in Zambia, his, uh, his wife said to him, can you eat evangelism? Uh -huh. What are you going evangelizing for? What a waste. The world always sees the things of God as a waste. And God always sees the things of the world as a waste. That's why in James 4, 4, they're in enmity with each other. But if you walk in humility, you will, count, you will make a decision to count some things as loss that maybe before you didn't. And then happening to you, you will suffer some loss. It may cost your friends. It may cost your career. It may cost you your dream. I had a dream since I was 10 to be an engineer. Now you're a missionary in a third world country. I had a dream when I was four years old to be a journalist. Now the only notes you take are in church. I had a dream to be a college professor. Now you're a Sunday school teacher. Loss and gain in the kingdom of God. Losing. I have suffered loss. And if you follow in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talks about in verse 23 all the way to verse 28, he talks about all these things he lost. The great Paul is now beaten with rods, thrown in the sea, imprisoned. And as he writes this letter, he talks about, I have suffered loss. Meanwhile, I'm in jail. <laughs> I'm in jail suffering loss. Loss of reputation, loss of finances. Because when Paul was doing all these things, he had a career. He was being financed. He was being supported. He was being encouraged. He lost all of that. He's gone back to making tents. I can guarantee you as a Pharisee, he wasn't making tents. Here he is, name dragged through the dirt by the most respected people in the city, among his own people, fixing tents. A worthwhile profession but not necessarily a profitable one and not necessarily glamorous. 
suffer loss, suffer loss. And he says this, I count them dung. And he really has this, this financial mindset going on because he says, in these, three, in these chapters, especially these last four verses, he says, three times loss and two times gain. He starts doing this mental calculations. Romans 6 has a good word for that, logizomai. It's an accounting term. It's like you take two things and you compare them and you start doing like this. You start doing addition and subtraction. And God's calculator is different than our calculator. Addition and subtraction. He says, I count it as dung, utterly worthless and profitless. And this is the effect of humility. There is fleshly gain and there is spiritual loss, but I walk in humility and now there's spiritually gain, but then there's fleshly loss. There's a change. There's a change. And I don't want this change. I don't want it in the flesh. I don't desire it. It's just like the cross. I don't want the cross. Anyone that raised their hands and says, yes, I want the cross. You're lying. You don't want the cross. You need the cross. You don't want the cross. It's no better than when Christ came. The world needed the cross, but they didn't want the cross. It's the same in the church. We need the cross. We don't want the cross. I don't wake up in the morning, yes, crucify me today. Thank you. Crucify. Ah, I'm going to go to the cross and die to the flesh this morning. Ha. Right after cereal. No. I don't want that. Yeah, I'll catch it after dinner or something. Dessert even. Nobody wants the cross. No cross, no Christ. I cannot experience the life of God except on the other side of the cross. My relationship with Christ is through the cross. That's why it's called the cross life. No cross, no life. They're connected eternally and spiritually. Because the opportunity for us is through the cross. So is the experience for us through the cross. Paul says, in humility, I submit. I like the, I like the uh, J.B. Phillips translation for um, Romans 12, verse 1, when it says, I present my body. King James says, uh, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, King James says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, J.B. Phillips' translation says this, seeing with open arms the mercies of God. In other words, I've got this vision of the mercy of God. I am compelled, I'm compelled to present myself. I don't want the cross, but when I see the mercy of God, I am compelled. I'm drawn in, I'm enticed, because I don't just see the cross, I see beyond the cross and I see Christ. So then I reckon in my mind, if that's what it takes to experience Christ, then let me have the cross. I don't want the cross, I don't like the cross. A good example of seeing beyond the cross is Hebrews 12 too. The writer says about Christ, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Now, one interpretation of that verse is that the joy was before the cross. Another interpretation of that verse is that the joy is beyond the cross. I tend to believe the latter, beyond the cross. Christ endured the cross because he saw the fellowship beyond the cross. You and I, in our own experiential walk with God, yes, there's a cross in our life. Yes, I have to suffer loss. And yes, I'll count some things as loss. But beyond my counting, there's Christ. Beyond my counting, there's Christ. So I'll count, not begrudgingly, though I don't want it, but I, I count with hope. I count with faith. I count with the promise in my left hand and joy in my right hand because beyond the cross is Christ. I count. And I may suffer. 
But it's like Jesus told John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. He said, suffer it so for now. Suffer it so for now. There's some things in my life that I will suffer, and I suffer it so for now. Because that is not my life. That is just a part of my life. I may be in prison now, but that may not be my life. That is not my, prison is not my life. It's not my life. So I'm counting and I'm suffering, but there's life beyond my counting and there's life beyond my suffering. It is the life of God. That is the problem with religion. It promises the life of God based upon performance. And, the, and Christianity promises the life of God based upon the cross. The experience and the work and the person of the cross. Paul said, my thinking, God didn't just change my mind. God gave me a new mind. He gave me a new mind. That's why he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, you have the mind of Christ. He gave me a new mind and a new life in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and a new heart in Ezekiel 36, 26, and a new family in Galatians 4, 4, and 5. It's all new. He didn't renovate. He replaced. He replaced. We're not driving used cars. It's brand new spaceships. Not cars anymore. He's up elevating it. Suffering loss. I often think about that in missions. I see men of God who've given up tremendous things. Tremendous things. C.T. Studd gave up a lot. He was willing to count for loss, some things. One of the top five cricketers in his, his day, he had an inheritance of, I would say today, worth almost a quarter of a million dollars. And he said on his brother's deathbed, his brother was dying. He was sick and dying. He looked at it, and as a young man, he said this, what is all the fame and flattery worth in the faith of eternity? And in that moment, he made a decision to give his inheritance away. He gave one-fourth to D.L. Moody. He gave one-fourth to George Mueller. He gave one-fourth to the Salvation Army. And then he gave one-fourth to a man named Holland in England who worked with poor people. Just gave it away. He counted it as loss. Great sportsman, counted as loss. Great inheritance, counted as loss. Great reputation, counted as loss. Like Moses in Hebrews 11, 25 and 26, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ. Nobody volunteers for that, by the way. I want to have the reproach of Christ. No, you don't. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect with the recompense of the reward. Counting it for loss. You don't hear many messages in many churches talking about counting it for loss. They teach godliness is gain. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, from such withdrawal, the Bible says. From such withdrawal. Those who teach godliness is gain. I'm not even saying that the mission of the church is that godliness is lost materialistically. What I am, if you're blessed, praise the Lord. But what I am saying is this. When you walk in humility, it's like Pastor Lange's offering, which was excellent the other night. I liked it a lot, actually. When I'm walking in humility, everything's available. When I'm walking in humility, there's no out of bounds for God in my life. So if, if there's no out of bounds for God, I'm walking in grace, I realize who owns everything, then there's an availability in my heart by faith to take my hands off of things. And they may not be bad, and by the way, what I count for loss, you may not. 
It's not uniform and it's not a standard because that's not grace. There may be things that you can put your hands on, but God says for me, no. It's not because I'm better than you or you're better than me. According to the purpose of God for my life, God says you have to count that as loss. When you walk in humility, it's not about you anyway. It's about who you're looking at. Remember the picture. I'm on my knees, hands extended, worshiping God. It's about him. You say, well, I could never die for my faith. Maybe God hasn't asked you to. Relax. Maybe that's for your neighbor sitting beside you right now. Maybe not. Who is Pastor Ronaldo anyway? Maybe not. Sometimes um, people get caught up in missions. They think, well, you know, so-and-so flies 5,000 miles away. Wow, that's amazing. That's just God for them. God for you might be win the guy at 7-Eleven. Beautiful. That's God for them. What is the will of God? What is God for me? I find rest in that. I find him in that. God forbid you fly 5,000 miles away to realize the will of God was right here. I think that's the greater sin, personally. I just want to be where, I want to be where God wants me to be. End of story. There's no glory in either place except for his anyway, right? C.T. Studd. And as you've heard, in the, at the age of 55, he's been letting, this is interesting about God, be careful when you start walking in humility because you keep letting go, you'd be surprised what God will have you letting go. <laughs> you start putting like a barrier, like, okay, God, I've let go of enough. You ever felt that? <laughs> you've been tied there for a while, like, I've given enough. Now, you've been serving God for a while, I've done enough. I think this, the, the great story Pastor Shala told a while ago about, um, how he uh, was door knocking, and he met this guy who was Catholic. Oh, I'm sorry, he met a pastor, and, and who was a, formerly a pastor, I, I think, yeah. Knocked on his door, and the guy said, uh, he was just explaining to Pastor Shallow about how much she has served God for all these years, and I laid my life down, and then Pastor Shallow looked at him and said, who's counting? Who's counting? Malachi 3.16, yes, there's a book of remembrance, but who's counting? Not no ticker. You, your angel's not in heaven with a ticker. Okay, 25 years of serving God, 26 years of serving God, 27 years of serving God. Who's counting? What is time to God anyway? If I'm walking in humility, I'm letting go, and it feels the same as it did five years ago. In fact, it might be even be easier to let go, to count as lost. The counting gets simpler because I realize it's God and not me. So at 55 years old, C.T. Studd let go again. Because cannibals need Jesus, so he lets go again. And he goes to a different continent, in Africa. You know the story. His wife was sick in the beginning. He didn't go with her. Two mission boards rejected him. Said, we don't think you're healthy enough or strong enough spiritually to go. So we're not going to support you. He actually turned down support from another institution because he didn't agree with them doctrinally. And he goes to Africa and he served for another 20 years. That was God for him. Be careful when you count. You don't know where you're gonna go. You never know. Counting. Count it for loss. What are you holding on to tonight? There's the obvious, then there's the little secret rooms we have. That nobody knows we have. And we're holding. Because we're like, you know, God doesn't want this right now. With things I thought were gain, I count as loss. Loss. How many of you heard the story of William Borden? Raise your hand. Great story. Do you know how those three phrases got in his Bible? They didn't all arrive at the same time. Most people tell this story, and they tell the end. The three phrases are in his Bible. Not the front, by the way, the back. But they don't tell you how they got in his Bible. He was actually an amazing man. He was heir to the Borden fortune. 
the milk dairy company, huge conglomerate, still big today. At the age of 16, for his birthday present, his father gave him a trip around the world. Nothing your dad can do that. Happy birthday, go around the world. 16, you and I, we're, we're looking for like a used car. <laughs> or at least permission to drive dad's car. Today, these kids today, you know, 14 years old, they got keys to a car. I grew up just using somebody's car. Hey, I get to get behind the wheel. But he got a trip around the world. He went to India. He went to Asia. He went to Europe. And the first thing that William Borden saw was hurting people. And it moved him at 16 years old. It moved him so much that on this trip, this around, that's why I really believe young people should take trips, take missions trips. I don't care if you have no call for missions. See the world. If you can save the money, do it. Get a view of the world beyond the internet. Don't watch it on the internet, or on your e-pad or iPad, whatever. Be the pad, go. Just go. It's amazing. Just be the pad, I'm the pad. Push this button, here I go, there I am. I don't even need Wi-Fi, just go. Be the pad. Apple will steal that from me, I'm sure. <laughs> so, William Borden writes a letter back home that he has made a decision to become a missionary. He, has, he, he, he plans to go to college, but he's already made his mind up, I'm going to be a missionary. So he writes a letter. One of his friends wrote him back and says, you are wasting your life at 16 years old for that decision. At that time, he wrote the first phrase in his, in his Bible. He wrote down, no reserves. 16 years old, he put the first phrase in, no reserves. That was all that was in his Bible at 16, but he made a decision in 1905, no reserves. In other words, I'm holding nothing back. Everything is available to be counted as loss at 16 years old. Amazing decision. Then he went to Yale, and all of his classmates said he was more spiritually mature than most of the men on the campus. And he went to an assembly, and one time he heard a message about purpose. But he walked away disturbed because he felt like the speaker never told them what the purpose was. He just said, you need purpose, and never identified it. Never identified it. So he decided to do something on Yale campus. So he got a friend, and they started a prayer meeting. Then he began to invite other friends. Then at one point, of the 1,300 students on the campus, 1,000 were in a prayer meeting with him in different groups. He started going out to witness and win drunks and widows and the disabled. Often they said they would find him in bars, sitting in corners with alcoholics, giving them the gospel. He was aggressive. There was a Yale missions conference. He would lead that. He also started the Yale Hope Mission just to reach those kind of people. He did all this in college. And when he graduated in 1909, he had numerous job offers. Numerous job offers. So he was rich, he had job offers. He denied them all. And he wrote in the back of his Bible, no, ret no retreat. After graduation, no retreat. So far in his Bible, no reserves, no retreat. He went on to go to Princeton and do graduate work. He sailed to China because he wanted to reach North Chinese Muslims. But he wanted to learn Arabic. So then he went down to Egypt to learn Arabic. And while he was at Arabic, in Egypt rather, learning Arabic, he, he, um, he contracted, thank you, spinal meningitis. And then he died. 1913, 25 years old. So from 16 to 25. That was the light of William Borden, 16 to 25, nine years. And somewhere between sailing to China in 1912 and 1913, he wrote the final statement, no regrets. No regrets. In other words, I held nothing back. I'm not going back. And I don't regret the decision. Now, most likely, he wrote the decision 
when he contracted spinal meningitis. Young as he was, I mean, think about all that he did in college. So much is made about his vision for missions. He was amazing at Yale. He transformed his college. He could have easily complained. He could have easily said, oh my God, I've given all my life to God at Yale, and this is what my life has become. No regrets. See, when I walk in humility, I don't live in regret of what I've let go because I just see what I've gained. I just see what the gain has nullified the loss. Paul's like, I'll do it again and again and again. His biographer said this, a wave of sorrow went around the world because Borden not only gave away his wealth, he gave away himself. In a way so joyous and so natural, it seemed a privilege rather than a sacrifice. It was almost honorable to die the way he died. The world saw a loss and God saw gain. See, anything that God leads me to count as loss is always gain to him. Anytime I suffer loss is gain to God. Because it's just like that great verse. When we lose for his sake, for his sake in Matthew 15, we lose for his sake. We have not lost, we've gained. That's what Paul is talking about in Philippians chapter 3. He's saying, I've counted it all as loss, but it's gain for me. And if I'm going to walk with God, I'm going to only walk with him in humility. And if I'm going to walk in humility, the effect of humility is I will count some things as loss, and I will suffer loss. But have I lost? Have I lost? In the big picture, have I lost or really have I gained? William Borden did more in nine years than most people do in 90. We always think about those little statements being quickly scribbled in the back of, in the back of his Bible. But it was progressive. It was progressive. And so it is with you and I. It's progressive. Maybe in the beginning it's no reserves. And I don't even know what that means to you tonight. No reserves. Then later down the road, I'm walking with God. No retreat. I'm a little scared. I'm a little bit unsure, but I'm not going back now. God's brought me too far. He's brought me way too far to stop now. And then things don't work out the way I want them to work out. I don't get what I thought I was going to get. No regrets. No one goes to heaven regretting. They only go to hell regretting. Regret is not a mindset of a believer going to heaven. The good old days were not so good. Things I counted as gain, I count as loss. Only a mind that has been affected by humility can think that way. That's what Paul is persuading us in the Philippian church. You may suffer because your pastor is sick and your, and your bishop is in jail. You may suffer. And you may count as loss some situation, but that's okay. That's all right. See through the cross. See beyond the cross and see life with me. And if you do, you will see gain. Amen? Amen. Any questions at all? We have a few minutes left. Yes, sir. First approach is shock, because I don't really believe I can think the wrong thoughts. I'm the biggest fan of my own thoughts. So when, I, when, it, when God actually shows me I've thought the wrong thoughts, you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. What? Huh? I actually have to get over the shock that my thoughts do not match God's thoughts. Then once I do, the measure of my maturity is correctability. 
Can I be corrected by God correcting my thoughts? It might even be a message. It might be the Holy Spirit. It might be the Bible. It might be another believer. Okay. So the way I've been thinking about this is wrong. Okay, God. First thing is, I'm transparent before God. The one person you can always be transparent before is God. You want to be angry? Be angry. You want to be hurt? Be hurt. You want to be wounded? Be wounded. You, you have that liberty with God because he has the ultimate capacity to take it. You try being hurt, wounded, and angry with somebody else. They don't have the capacity to handle it. That's why he's the comforter. He's the God of all comfort and the Father of mercies, 2 Corinthians 1 and 2. I can come to him with my problems. Bring it to God. That's the first thing. Bring it to God and be transparent and say, okay, God, change my thinking. James chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, it says, you have not because you ask not. And in the next verse, it says, and ask in faith. God, change my thinking. When you discern your thinking wrong, God, change my thinking. Usually what God will do is this. He will love you in the moment. He will reveal his mind to you. And then he will gracefully encourage you. Like as Pastor Valley has pointed out so often, the one who comforts you is the one who convicts you. It's the same God. We have, this, we have this mental picture of God with a bat. And we're like, bam, see, I told you I was wrong. That's not God. God is not a man. God is not a man. So he doesn't handle my difficulties, even like I do. He is not intimidated by my failures. Yet he is moved by my heartache. God is unique. There's nobody else in your life like God. No one. And the greatest thing a believer can have is liberty with God. Because then I can come to God no matter how bad, it's like, no matter how bad things happen, I, okay, God, here I am. Here I am again. I know I've come to you with this problem 37 times. Here's 38. And he's all right with that. Because God is happy that you came. It's like the, the, the prodigal in Luke 15. His father was just happy that he came. We'll, we'll sort the other stuff out. That's, it'll, it'll get, trust me. I'm just happy he's here. God is looking for fellowship. Christ died to open the door for fellowship. Since Genesis chapter 3, God has been looking for fellowship with us. Because in Revelation 4, we were created for his pleasure. For his glory. And it is the glory of God to fellowship with us. It's the glory of God, not the glory of men. So God says, come. Matthew 11, 28, 29, there is no prerequisite to come. It just says, come. Active voice, you come. God doesn't drag me to him. His arms are just extended, waiting. Isaiah 30, he waits to be gracious to me. And then he says in verse, chapter, verse 18 and verse 19, he says, then I will be. Just in case you were wondering what the outcome is. We're not Muslims. We know the outcome. I will be gracious. <laughs> not like, you know, what did Brent say earlier? Uh, it's not like, uh, uh, we'll get back to you. Yes, I saw a hand back there. Was that you, Scotty? Yeah. I like what you said about the cross in Hebrews 12, too. Enduring <clears throat> uh, the cross, <clears throat> the joy that was set before me. How you said that? How did you say? I said that in Hebrews 12, 2, there's two applications for that. There's some people that apply it and say that it was talk, Christ was talking about what was before him, before he endured it. And then the other application is he was thinking prophetically beyond it about what was going to be the result of his work on the cross. I tend to lean that way. Christ looked through the cross to the other side of what was going to happen, which gave him the motivation to embrace the cross. So in my life, I apply that the same way. There are going to be when God experientially brings the cross into my life, and I have to experience death in a situation. I have to be wrong. I have to bear the hurt. I have to let go of the flesh. I have to lay down Ephesians 4.22, the old man. And I don't want to do that. Because I like how the old man fits. I was born wearing that coat, so I don't want to put that one down. But when I see the value or the benefit beyond it, Therein I find my motivation and my capacity to let it go. And what God does is this. 
When he presents me with an experiential cross, he gives me a picture of life beyond it. He doesn't just say, take up the, cross, or, take up the effects of the cross or lay down yourself. He doesn't just say, experience the death experience. Be the corn of wheat in the ground just for the sake of dying. He never gives you a picture of death without also including a picture of life. Asceticism gives you this picture of death with no view of, the, with no view of life. You're like stuck on Good Friday for the rest of your life. You just, I die daily. That's all I'm doing is dying. There's no living. They got half the problem. They don't ever get to Sunday. So you just keep dying and suffering, and there's no life. And works lets me experience death, but never gives me a vision of life or the possibility of life. It's like works-oriented people are always miserable because it's, it's like a consistent death and a consistent failure to experience life. So they're miserable and they're bitter. One of the secret character traits of works-oriented legalistic people is they have private bitterness. Hebrews 12, 15, they are secretly very bitter. There's a root of bitterness because of dissatisfaction, because of a lack of experience in the life of the cross, beyond the life of the cross, resurrection life. They've heard about it, they've read about it, but they never experience it. It's like a carrot and a stick. They're just chasing it, but it's not happening. After a while, you, you know, human capacity, you get frustrated, then you get bitter. Then you live in one or two mindsets. Hypocrisy, you pretend like you have but you haven't, or condemnation because you're condemning yourself because something is wrong with you, that's why you can't get there. When it's the method that's wrong. One more question and we'll close. Yes, Barbara. Just a comment on what you were saying, that verse. Um, when I was in Israel a couple years ago, um, the guy took us to the place where Christ was crucified. And he explained that um, the view that Christ had as he was being crucified directly faced the tomb that he would be raised from. Mm. And he said, he used that verse, and he said, you know, Christ endured the cross, like, experientially in that moment, and he was facing the reality of the joy that was set before him. Wow. That's true. It's awesome. Picture of resurrection life. It's good. I need that. I need to know that I can experience the life of God today. Then I'm willing to take it. Then I'm willing to die to do that. Because, I, because it's interesting about the life of God. When you are in the life of God experientially and the fruit of the Spirit is made manifest in your life, that is attractive to you. Because there are things in that life that the natural life cannot give you. Joy, peace, contentment. And you like those things. So you want that. So you're almost willing to do that or experience that so that you can experience that. And the more you experience it, the more you want to experience it. And then you start finding out that those things don't satisfy. I don't personally believe that that decision that Paul came to in Philippians chapter 3 you read verses 8 through 11, it's actually one sentence. I know we break it up in messages, but it's one sentence. I don't believe he came to that conclusion in Acts chapter 9. I think that was progressive, just like in the life of William Borden. I think it was a progressive decision. Then he came to the point where he said, once and for all, they're lost to me. They're lost to me. Because some of us get discouraged sometimes because maybe there's things in our life we have not, we have not once and for all counted as loss. And you could leave a class like this discouraged because you say, oh my God, I, I got about 48 things that I have not counted as loss. I got a dump truck full of things that I've got. <laughs> they're not lost at all, Pastor, and all. They're like a gain, hello? It's okay. I come to that conclusion because God brings me to that conclusion. What did Paul say in the next chapter, Philippians chapter 4? I have learned contentment. Contentment was not a gift. It was a fruit. A fruit of what? Fellowship with God. He learned that lesson. 
That goes back to the effect of humility. When you walk with God in humility, there's a profound effect on the change in the way you think, and it's progressive. It's progressive. I'm not talking process theology. I'm talking about steps of growth. Nobody measures that. There's no standard formula for growth. But God brings me there. God can bring me to the place when I can count as loss. By the way, even your suffering of things is also progressive. There's some things that you will lose in the future that today if I said you would lose them, you could never understand you could lose that because you have no capacity for that loss. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there are losses that will happen in your life that God allows to happen based upon your capacity. And as you grow with God, along with the addition based on capacity, there is also subtraction based on capacity. It's all on capacity. Because God is constantly trying to build my capacity for him. Amen? Amen. Father, bless us now as we dismiss. Thank you so much for your word that is a lamp into our feet, a light into our path. And we thank you that it is you who cause us to grow, to walk with you. It is you that teaches us how to live this life. And you empower us to do so. We thank you, God, that you lead us to count things as lost. And you will bring us to the place where we will make that choice willingly. Help us to grow, God. In your son's name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.